All humans are in need of sleep. Jared Lofner is a human. Hence, Jared Lofner is in need of sleep. Quote by Jared Lofner. On January 8th, 2011, Jared Lee Lofner opened fire on a crowd outside a supermarket near Tucson, Arizona, killing six people and injuring 14 more, including critically wounding the speaker, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. In the two months prior to this attack, Jared Lofner made a series of YouTube posts that gave a glimpse into his mental state. These videos feature written text, almost entirely in the form of these syllogisms. Over and over, he'll make a conditional statement. If one thing is true, if BCE years are unable to start, then ADE years are unable to begin. And then another conditional statement, BCE years are unable to start and reach some conclusion, thus ADE years are unable to begin based on this logical syllogism type of structure. But often the actual content of what he's saying is nonsensical. If your editing of every belief in religion reaches the final century, then the writer for every belief in religion is you. Your editing of every belief in religion reaches the final century. Thus, the writer for every belief in religion is you. The repetition itself seems like a verbal stereotypy, a kind of pathological repetitiveness. But the fact that the repeated structure is in these formal syllogisms, it's as if some part of his mind is desperately trying to dig its way out of the nonsense into sense by imposing this logical structure. A mind that is fragmenting into chaos but trying to regain a sense of order amongst that chaos, but ultimately failing to do so. If Jared Lofner was trying to claw his way back out of madness, he failed. So was this madness, that is psychosis, enough to explain the murderous rampage? Or can we say anything more about the cause of the killing or the cause of the psychosis? I'm a neuroscientist and psychiatrist speculating about the Jared Lee Lofner case. Any opinions I express here are purely my own and do not represent the views of any institutions. So before we talk more about these videos and the mental state of Jared Lofner at that time, let's go back and review some of his biography. Jared Lee Lofner was born on September 10th, 1988 in Tucson, Arizona to parents Amy and Randy Lofner. His father was a retired gasoline truck driver and his mother worked at the city parks department. The family was described as very private by a neighbor, and in particular, the father, Randy Lofner, has been described as reclusive. Jared himself also tended to be quiet, described as a scrawny kid who would fly under the radar in social situations. Much of his teenage life revolved around music. He played saxophone in a jazz band and at football games, and jammed with a friend's garage band. He was reportedly a talented musician. In fact, a high school bandmate, Christina Lunderberg, described him as really good and talented and arrogant. So maybe the kind of guy who was good at his instrument, but knew he was good, you know, had some significant ego attached to his musical abilities, okay? In early high school, he had a girlfriend, Kelsey, who has been quoted as calling Jared sweet and caring when they were in a relationship. However, sometime in the 10th grade, Jared endured a breakup with that girlfriend and his behaviors started to change. His closest high school friend at the time, Zach Osler, said it was after this breakup that Jared's life, quote, started to come apart as Jared became progressively more weird. He also started drinking heavily, smoking a lot of cannabis, and delving into other drugs and hallucinogens. He would talk excitedly about his theories of conscious dreaming, but also intermittently fall into these stupors where he would just stare unnervingly at his friends for a period of time. By his junior year, he had stopped playing saxophone, his friends had changed to more drug-oriented people, and his grades had plummeted. He then didn't return to high school for his senior year, dropping out at the age of 18. He was also working at a Quiznos sandwich shop at the time, and his employer said that while he was initially an enthusiastic worker, he underwent a dramatic personality transformation, after which he became more withdrawn and negligent in his duties. Ultimately, he was fired for that reason. So this idea of a transformation both in personality and in level of functioning definitely makes me think of the prodrome 
of schizophrenia. His age of onset is also classic for this. You know, schizophrenia in males typically has its onset with florid psychotic symptoms in the late teens or early 20s, about 18 to 25 years old. And the prodromal period will be this variable period for a few months up to maybe two years prior to that first psychotic break. The prodrome is thought to happen in about 75% of people who go on to develop schizophrenia. And the prodrome generally consists of a kind of social withdrawal, a worsening and functioning, and maybe some odd behaviors or odd beliefs, but not yet the outright psychosis symptoms. So not evident hallucinations or clearly defined delusions. It's been described to me that in the prodrome, a patient will have a sense that something weird is going on, right? That something weird is going on in their external world. And maybe that they're on the verge of some great revelation in their inner world. And then when that revelation comes, it's actually the psychotic break. It's like, oh, I get it now. I've been sent here to prevent an earthquake, but the CIA doesn't want me to prevent it because the earthquake is part of their plan. And that's why they had that dentist put this speaker in my tooth implant to tell me not to do it. You know, these are real, based on real examples of things I've heard some multiple times, like the idea of a speaker being implanted in a tooth, uh, which for the patient is an explanation of why they're hearing voices, right? The auditory hallucinations. Uh, and often it's also connected to some bigger group like the CIA or FBI that's broadcasting messages to them uh, to explain the hallucinations. So that moment of revelation is when the prodrome converts into full psychosis. And then assuming that psychosis persists for more than six months, that's when you have the DSM criteria met for a diagnosis of schizophrenia. But so again, Jared Loeffner undergoing that type of change also corresponding to a period of heavier substance use definitely sounds like a prodrome, though there's some question of when exactly it converts to full-blown psychosis. I'm guessing that transition is around age 18, what would have been his senior year. But clearly during high school, he goes from a relatively normal teen, you know, band kid, and then within a year or two, drops out of high school, is unable to hold down a basic job, and is acting increasingly strangely. People that know him are clearly wondering what's going on with him. That's even before he actually dropped out of high school. And, you know, often the notion that a period of time actually represented a schizophrenia prodrome is only clear in retrospect, you know, that it was something more than depression or just social withdrawal for some other reason. And so after dropping out of high school, Jared Loeffner has a couple years of seeming aimlessness with some more oddities. He has an arrest for drug paraphernalia, but then the charges are dropped. He then goes through a tagging phase where he is spraying graffiti with phrases from literature, reportedly. And he would also just sit in unlocked cars until one night when he was chased off by a car's owner that put an end to that. Uh, and he actually tried to enroll in the army, but at the entrance exam, he was disarmingly forthright about the extent to which he used cannabis in the past you know, frequently and heavily for years prior, and that gets him rejected from the army. At about a year before the murders, he briefly tries working as a volunteer dog walker at an animal shelter. He had apparently always liked dogs from a young age, but at this shelter, he doesn't seem to be able to register that the dogs aren't allowed in certain areas, including an area that was being disinfected due to an animal having been sick with parvovirus, <clears throat> which is potentially lethal, and he keeps trying to insist on letting the dogs go into that area. So he's asked not to return until he can respect those boundaries, and he just doesn't return. So that definitely sounds pretty odd, right? But can't quite tell how much of that is just oddness and lack of awareness versus something darker or more delusional. Don't have enough information about that. Where the bizarre public behaviors became really evident was in Pima Community College, where he enrolled in some classes around that time, a few years after high school, and for the year leading up to the murders in early 2011. So according to a Wall Street Journal article published later, 
Math instructor Ben McGahee said, Mr. Loeffner's frequent off-topic outbursts during an algebra course frightened other students. And on his first test, Mr. Loeffner wrote Mayhem Fest in large letters. Mr. McGahee, the math teacher, said he tried to remove Mr. Loeffner from class on several occasions, but college officials didn't agree. A spokesperson from the school said the school didn't notify law enforcement about Mr. Loeffner because he didn't appear to be a threat. Spokesperson was quoted as saying, he said things that were strange and he was a handful in class, but he didn't threaten any students. Then there was an incident in spring of 2010 where a public safety officer responded to a call from a staffer in the campus library regarding Jared Loeffner making some loud noises at a computer. When questioned by this officer, Loeffner explained that he was really into music and sometimes he would be enjoying the music and excitedly utter phrases or words from the songs, according to the report, while he was listening on headphones. So this to me sounds like it could have been a cover story for having hallucinations, you know, hearing voices and actually responding to them, which is something you see when the hallucinations are severe enough. It's like the person can't help but interact with them to talk back to them. But then the fact that he's covering it up with, oh, I was just listening to music and, and saying words from the songs. For some reason, he knows he's not supposed to be doing this. It may be because he actually believes the officer is part of some conspiracy that he thinks is going on. You know, who, who knows at that point what his interpretation was. But I imagine it wasn't actually the case that he was just intermittently singing along to a song because I don't think that would have resulted in someone in the library calling the you know, campus officer on him, right? Then the most disturbing story I came across from his time at Pima Community College was in a creative writing class. A girl in the class tearfully read a emotional poem about a terminated pregnancy, and Jared started laughing maniacally and said things completely out of context, something about strapping a bomb or dynamite to the fetus. Uh, and obviously his class was very disturbed. And, and at that point, it's clear to me that he is fully in a psychosis and a severe one at that, to the point of not registering that anyone is real besides himself. Bloiler, Eugen Bloiler, was the Swiss psychiatrist who, in 1908, introduced the term schizophrenia for what had previously been called precocious dementia or dementia precox in the 1800s. And before that, maybe just madness, like in Shakespeare, or demon possession, depending on the cultural context. Uh, but so Bloiler coined schizophrenia for a chronic psychotic disorder and in Bloiler's characterization, he noted a core feature as being autism. Now, autism as a term has since been repurposed for the neurodevelopmental disorder of social deficits we, we now know as autism spectrum disorder. But what Bloiler meant in schizophrenia, and if you think about what autism means, so auto like self, um, autism would literally mean selfism. And this was meaning a retreat into the self as the only reality. So I would propose that we, we've lost that idea a little bit in schizophrenia, but we could maybe use instead of autism, a term like solipsism, which in philosophy refers to the belief that one's own mind is the only thing we can really know is real. But in schizophrenia, a solipsism, I, I mean, not as a philosophical belief, but as the actual nature of the experience, that one's own mind is the only thing that actually exists. So maybe experiential solipsism would be a better term, but that's kind of clunky. The point is, for Jared Loeffner, the idea that he was being incredibly insensitive in that class, I don't think would have even registered with him at that point because he just truly felt like nothing was real except his personal experience. So maybe he laughed because he felt, well, some kind of stimulation from this poem, stimulation that we would all experience as sympathy and sadness, but for him, it wasn't anchored to anything like sympathy 
because other people didn't actually exist. So this is different from antisocial personality disorder or psychopathy, where the person does know cognitively that other people exist, but doesn't feel empathy for them. This is a complete loss of touch with the experience of other people as real beings. So what happened from there is that the school, Pima Community College, said that Jared Loeffner was required to take a mental health evaluation to continue, but he evidently refused that and instead dropped out in October of 2010, about three months prior to the murders in January of 2011. And it's soon after that that he starts posting his YouTube videos. So in the month after dropping out, he posts one called How To Your New Currency. And again, it always has these syllogisms like, if I'm thinking of creating a new currency, then I'm thinking of a design for my new coins, size, shape, color, material, and image to start a new money system. I'm thinking of creating a new currency. Therefore, I'm thinking of a design for my new coins, size, shape, color, material, and image to start a new money system. Another one here where he's talking about starting with zero coins. And if he adds zero, he still ends with zero. But if he starts with zero coins and add, adds one, now he has one coin in his treasury. He seems to be believing that he is going to be able to create a new currency with his mind. Then he has these concerns about time, like the idea that BCE has numbers going backwards from zero, whereas what he calls ADE, that's actually a combination, I guess, of AD, which is what we used to call the time going forward from Christ. We would now call it CE, I guess, common era. But he's he's disturbed by the idea that, that time goes in, in two directions, but that there's uh, no end point, I guess, to to time in the future, something like that. And then he goes back to coins. So here I, I can't quite make sense of what he's trying to say that you can make new coins with your mind too, something like that. Right, you, you have the power with your mind, right? I guess is his point, if anything. So also in November, the month after he drops out, he has this pretty angry seeming post about Pima Community College. And again, it's in this syllogistic phrase, every police officer in the United States as of now is unconstitutionally working. Pima Community College police are police in the United States. Therefore, Pima Community College police are unconstitutionally working. So he doesn't seem to realize that he needs to define his premises, right? He assumes that he's got these accurate premises that every police officer is unconstitutionally working. If his premises were true, then yes, these would be valid conclusions, right? So the, the structure is technically correct, but the, the result is essentially meaninglessness. So this video to me does suggest a kind of persecutory ideation about what happened to him at Pima Community College. If the police remove you from the educational facility for talking, then removing you from the educational facility for talking is unconstitutional in the United States. The police remove you from the educational facility for talking, thus removing you from the educational facility for talking is unconstitutional in the United States. So he cannot recognize his own role. He, you know, he doesn't register to him why the campus police were talking to him. Uh, he seems to believe that he's being persecuted, right? It was a scam. You know, the, the fact that he was kicked out of algebra is proof of this scam that's being perpetrated against him. And he probably imagines other people would be outraged about this because he's, he's not living in a uh, consensus reality. Then he's got a little bit of grandiosity too. So he's got the persecutory delusions about unconstitutional police targeting him. And then he has this grandiosity that most people are illiterate. That theme kind of comes up several times in these videos. But if you agree, but if you believe in his mindset, you can create currency, you can create symbols. It's almost this kind of nihilistic existentialism seem to be like the foundational assumptions that are now being skewed through a psychotic thought disorder. So back, back to the first video, how to your new currency. Here, here's an example of what I mean by thought disorder. 
who possesses your new coin? You're distributing your new currency lethally to people or you're distributing your new currency non-lethally to people. You're not distributing your new currency lethally to people. Thus, you're distributing your new currency non-lethally to people. So what's clear to me and is also a limitation in interpreting delusional content is that there's what we call a formal thought disorder in, this, in these videos. And that is where the associations between concepts are difficult, if not impossible, to comprehend. So like here, the idea of distributing your currency lethally or non-lethally to people, we could wonder, well, does he mean, well, sometimes war is a way that new currencies might be introduced lethally to a new population, uh, but then you have to realize, wait, if I'm having to do that much of a, of a jump, that much mental work to make any sense of something, that in itself is a sign that there's a thought disorder here. Th these are disorganized thoughts because it shouldn't be that difficult or require such a leap to discern meaning from someone's speech. And so the fact is there's, there's probably not a meaning in the sense that we understand meaning. So here we have a video called How to Mind Controller. This is December. This is about a month before the attack on Gabby Giffords and, and the others at the event. First off, I have to wonder, similar to what I was saying at the beginning of this video about how using syllogisms might represent his mind trying to regain some order in the midst of chaos. The fact that he actually calls this video how to mind controller, would it be a reach to say he's choosing these words because at least unconsciously, he realizes that he needs to relearn how to control his mind because it's actually no longer in his control. You know, you could say that's a reach that, you know, really this is a, a grandiose delusion that he controls everything, but in kind of Freudian psychoanalytic terms, you know, where dreams are the unconscious presenting us with, with wishes that we want to fulfill, but don't have conscious access to them. In his dreamlike state of psychosis, is he actually conveying a wish to regain control of his mind? Just a thought. But if, if you look at the content here, if I'm the mind controller, then I control the belief and religion, action, thought, location, food. Uh, this is this is almost getting to the point of word salad. You know, down here, this is almost just a, a mixture of random phrases. So word salad is the name we give the most severe degree of thought disorder. And that's when there's not even a discernible connection between words in a, in a cluster of words. Um, thought disorder is loose associations or lack of connection between concepts. Once it's actually words don't make sense one after the other, that's word salad. Then strangely, the, the ones that are posted as the, the last videos, so in later December or mid mid December, he calls introduction Jared Lofner. And then the last one is hello. And he calls it my introduction to the channel. Also the introduction Jared Lofner video starts with my final thoughts. So again, this kind of temporal non-linearity so in his final thoughts video, he's again becoming concerned with the idea of time that in BCE, the years go backwards, but in ADE, they go, go forwards. He has this conclusion that the ADE, which he means CE or AD, are endless in year. They, they don't cease. Now, why is he concerned about that? He's not wrong that for now, the, the years just keep going up. But the fact that that's of great concern to him is a sign to me that he has what we call aberrant salience. So this is a defining feature of the way we think of schizophrenia now is you're getting these almost spurts of dopamine that because dopamine is about assigning salience or significance to things. If you imagine just getting random spurts of dopamine, the brain tries to interpret what something is significant, what's significant. And sometimes it's 
because it's random, you end up just assigning significance to seemingly random things because your dopaminergic system has sort of gone haywire. It's making you think this is significant. You know, that two red cars in a row, that there's something, there must be something about that. And so you reach for interpretations to explain why you're, why you're feeling this sense of significance. But it's, it's really just a dopamine gone haywire. So that seems to be what's going on here. He's not wrong that the years just keep going up without a, an endpoint in sight, but most of us aren't concerned about that. You know, it's like, okay, for him, it seems very significant. You know, on the whole, I talked about the verbal stereotypy in terms of the repeated form, the repeated structures of syllogisms. There are also these repeated concepts that's sort of like a conceptual stereotypy where we have these the things about currency. There's other concepts related to dreaming, time, the alphabet and symbols. And there's also this sense that he's had a revelation about how arbitrary everything is or how arbitrary it can be. Like you can just create currency. It's arbitrary. And that, that basically seems to boil down to not realizing that there is a social consensus of what reality is. And that's why things like currency work. Currency or the alphabet, sure, in one sense, it's arbitrary, but it's not arbitrary that we all agree on what works. And so that's, that's why it works. Missing now that part of the mind that understands that there is such a thing as a consensus of reality, I think is why he has this grandiose sense that he has realized this secret, that everything is arbitrary, where to the rest of us, it's essentially just ramblings, you know, but everything is only arbitrary if you think a social consensus is arbitrary. So again, the last video he posted was December 15th, 2010. It's less than a month later. Uh, that there is the shooting at the Gabrielle Giffords event. So the attack itself is on January 8th, 2011. At about seven in the morning, he went to one Walmart store uh, trying to purchase ammunition. Unclear what happened, but he left that store and completed his purchase at another Walmart around 7.30 a.m. Later in the morning, he took a taxi to the Safeway supermarket outside Tucson, where Representative Giffords was holding a constituents meeting, and the shooting occurred at 10.10 a.m. It seems essentially he just walked up and opened fire aiming at Giffords at close range, but there was a large crowd there. And so numerous bystanders were hit. Six people were killed, either 13 or 14 injured. I've seen different numbers or 13 were hit by gunfire and one was injured while fleeing the scene. Giffords being the apparent target of the attack was shot in the head and critically injured, taken to a hospital in critical condition. Loeffner was then stopped by bystanders and was arrested by police saying only, I plead the fifth, as he was taken into custody. And then there was this photograph taken by the Pima County Sheriff's Forensics Unit, which was released to the media, published on front pages nationwide. The Washington Post described Loeffner's expression in the photo as smirking and creepy with hollow eyes ablaze. While the art director for the New York Times said the photo was featured on the front page because it was the picture of the day. It was intense and arresting. It invited you to look and study and wonder. And I would agree with that. It's an intense and arresting photograph. I feel almost as if there's a kind of deranged triumph in his expression. Uh, also something that tells me he's got a lot of adrenaline coursing through his veins. Maybe that's coming from the intensely open eyes and the tense musculature of his face. And then the, the sense that he's not living in our reality. I, I couldn't tell you where that comes from exactly, but I feel like you can just tell that by looking at this picture. So the fact that Gabrielle Giffords was a political figure led to this news story getting politicized almost immediately. There was a lot of talk about incendiary political speech coming from the right since Giffords was a Democrat, and concerns about civility and discourse generally that came out of this. Now, surely there is a broader debate to be had about political discourse and its effects on people that's ongoing. But in the case of Jared Loeffner, I think assigning political rather than personal motives 
was essentially a rush to judgment by a media looking to capitalize on political partisanship and people's interest in that. And I'm really only interested in even mentioning it here to make the point that I think the politicization around this event at the time actually obfuscated the real story, which is a story of severe mental illness. But as one example of the politics, the politicization, politicization, politicization here, I'll give just one example of a specific accusation that came out after this shooting, which was that Sarah Palin's campaign had incited this shooter. And that was based on this picture. Now, I mean, looking at this today, I have to say that this seems quite tame (laughs) compared to the political materials we're used to now, right? But yes, a, a dozen years ago, there was a media firestorm about this picture after the story broke about Congresswoman Giffords being shot. So essentially the Sarah Palin Political Action Committee had circulated some midterm election rallying materials, including this map with the electoral districts, including Gabby Giffords district, that the campaign was targeting to swing Republican in the midterms with these graphics of crosshairs over the districts. And the so the New York Times initially ran a story that said the political incitement of this electoral map with crosshairs on it was clear in its role in in Jared Loeffner's shooting. They did then correct this story three days later to say no connection was ever established. And uh, But honestly, I feel like their verbiage and, and uh, that of others in the media was to make it sound like, if you didn't see the picture, I, I feel like they made it sound like the crosshairs were over a picture of Gabby Gifford's head rather than just on a map like this with multiple of them. But, you know, what whatever. The Washington Post fact checker debunked this claim at the time and reiterated it years later. Look, feel free to Google this if you want. But what, what I actually care about from this whole tangent is that one of the reasons the Washington Post cites for disregarding the Palin campaign map in the motive for Jared Loeffner is that he had actually had an evident fixation on Giffords from well before these Palin campaign materials were ever published, uh, well before 2010 in general. And his fixation seemed to stem from a Congress on Your Corner event in Tucson, Arizona in 2007, when he would have been 18 years old. And according to a friend who Jared spoke to after the fact, Jared said she opened the floor for questions and Jared asked a question, which was, what is government if words have no meaning? And then Jared would tell the friend, can you believe it? They wouldn't answer my question. And ever since then, Jared thought she was fake and had something against her. Whether she actually answered it, I I could never find a consistent report on whether she said anything. It seems like she dismissed it to some extent or just didn't say anything and moved on to the next one. Whatever the answer was, it clearly didn't satisfy Jared Loeffner. And so his his friend who he talked to about this said it wasn't something that he would bring up day in, day out, but just periodically, if Gabby Giffords came up, he would talk about how she was fake. As part of a whole belief system, it seems that a lot of things were fake, you know, the government was fake in general, et cetera. And in fact, so three days after the shooting, authorities searched Jared Loeffner's home and filed criminal charges uh, based on items that showed he had plotted or premeditated her assassination. So he had a safe, which included a 2007 letter from Giffords thanking him for attending the constituent event. And on the envelope of that letter were the words, I planned ahead and the words assassination and Giffords, along with Jared Loeffner's signature. Almost like he wanted to show that he had been planning this, you know, the fact that he signed it. So again, I believe that this is a story not about politics. It is rather a cautionary tale about severe mental illness that is schizophrenia. But it should be said that severe mental illness is certainly not by itself a motive for murder. Mental illness doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in a person. And so perhaps there is some kind of 
personal motive. But if any decipherable motive can be ascertained here, it must be found through the foggy lens of a psychosis. So I'm going to suggest that there are two very important concepts here. One, narcissistic injury, and two, anosognosia. So first, I should say a narcissistic injury doesn't necessarily imply narcissistic personality disorder, but what it does imply is a narcissistic defense. And I would argue that it is always possible in severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia that a narcissistic defense is necessary for the person to shield themselves from the reality of what's actually going on with their brain. And this is, in fact, why delusions often have a grandiose quality. For example, the belief that the person is the only one who can save the world or is a reincarnation of Jesus Christ. These are actually fairly common claims in schizophrenia. In the case of Jared, you know, he says outright that he can control all religion and belief. He believes he can create currency, it seems. The point is that this kind of belief system, if it works internally to explain the strange experiences he's having, you know, these the salience attached to certain things that he is perceiving, perhaps hallucinations that he's experiencing, the narcissistic, grandiose type of defense as an explanation is much more attractive than, you know, having a broken brain that's playing tricks on you, which is the explanation they're going to be hearing from doctors and concerned family members. So if it's between, I have a broken brain and that would explain what's going on, or I'm a special, unique person, I'm the only one who can see these certain things, I certainly know which one of those explanations I'd want to pick. And it's not just their internal perceptions that they're having to explain. They're also going to have to start explaining why people are treating them differently. You know, why aren't people understanding the significance of what I'm saying? Or in some cases, you know, with thought disorder, people aren't even understanding what I'm saying at all. And so socially, they're aware of this response, but they're not aware of why people don't understand what they're saying. They just get a quizzical look or a dismissive comment in response, but don't understand why. And so this is why anosognosia is the other important concept. So anosognosia means non-awareness of a deficit. You definitely see this in people with stroke, depending on the involved locations. So a stroke patient may have a deficit where they can't move or feel their left arm, for example. But if the damage impairing their their left arm also involves a part of the brain, typically the right parietal that is involved in bodily awareness and not just motor control, the patient actually can't recognize that they can't move their arm and maybe don't even realize that their left arm belongs to them anymore. So a neurologist will show the patient their left arm and ask, Who's, whose is this? And the patient will actually say, well, that, that's yours, isn't it? Or I don't know, whose is that? because they, they just can't register the deficit. That, that awareness is gone. This can also happen in vision with uh, hemi neglect. So a stroke causing uh, part of your, you know, half of your visual field to go away. If you're anisognostic to the deficit, you'll fully believe that straight ahead is, is actually over here because you're now only aware of this half of your visual field and you're not aware that there is such a thing as the other half of your visual field so, you know, you'll think the middle of a line is right here. You know, if the line goes all the way across, you'll pick the middle is right here. Uh, won't know why you're walking uh, in a strange direction, things like that. So in schizophrenia, about half of the patients will be aware that they have symptoms or deficits from a disease process, you know, realize that their speech can be disorganized or that their thoughts aren't clear unless they take medications, which, which will improve this. But others, about half of the people with schizophrenia, do not and maybe cannot possibly realize it for similar reasons to the stroke patients, probably. And such, I suspect, was the case with Jared. When he was asking back in 2007, what is the purpose of government if words have no meaning? To him, this was an obviously important and profound question. 
And he thought it would register as similarly important and profound to others, maybe especially to someone in the government. So when he gets essentially a non-response, he doesn't know why due to anisognosia, and he's enraged due to narcissistic injury because the subconscious premise is that he's got to be on to something. He's on to something big with this new pattern of thinking, these revelations, this whole new revelatory reality he's living in. If he's not on to something big, if this new reality isn't affirmed, but rather rejected by everyone else, his whole world crumbles. And so the narcissistic defenses in schizophrenia can be rather tyrannical, insisting that you believe their reality. Because again, if you don't, well, it's, it's too terrible to even think for the person living in that reality. And to me, I would say, yes, that, that is terrible. Seeing someone slide into the quicksand of chronic psychosis, leaving forever the consensus reality that the rest of us occupy is an awful thing to witness. It's hard to imagine a state of feeling more alone than being the only person to live in some new alternate reality. So I, I obviously wish a vine could have been thrown to Jared Lofner as he was sinking into that quicksand to pull him out before he was all the way under. And, and I wish we knew better how to do this. And to say I sympathize with people to whom this departure from reality happens is not to say I excuse their actions. There was a saying in Christian circles, I remember, hate the sin, not the sinner. And I think a secularized society could sort of adapt this principle to a case like Jared Lofner's and say, hate the mental illness, not the mentally ill. I won't pontificate too much about my personal views on philosophical and religious concepts like free will and evil and their connection to mental illness. I don't actually think I'm smart enough to do that. Uh, but I will say in the US justice system, the question of not guilty by reason of insanity actually comes down to a definition of legal insanity, not a clinical definition of whether someone has a mental illness. And what legal insanity means in its essence is at the time of the crime, could the perpetrator tell the difference between right and wrong as applied to their actions? Or were they so impaired by their mental illness that they genuinely could not discern? You know, could their sense of morality have been so distorted that they may have legitimately believed that they were doing the right thing somehow? And again, that's not to say that that would mean they should be allowed to just be free in society in that case, but perhaps it would engender something different than the gut reaction of justice by way of retribution, because intentions do matter, right, in matters of morality. So I think in that case, it becomes more about justice by correction or restoration to whatever extent that's possible. Now, what actually happened in the case of Jared Lofner was that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and was initially found incompetent to stand trial, meaning his psychotic symptoms were so severe that he could not sufficiently understand what the court proceedings even meant or to participate meaningfully in counsel with his attorneys. And then after that finding, there was a question of whether he could be given antipsychotic medication against his will. And it was eventually determined that he could be forcibly medicated due to dangerousness to self and others, which is different than being forcibly medicated just to restore him to competence to stand trial, which is not allowed. But for dangerousness, it was found that he could be given medications against his will. That went on for about a year, actually. And aside Generally, what forcible medication means is that if the patient does not agree to take a daily dose of medication by mouth, they are allowed to be restrained and given a shot of the same version of the antipsychotic medication intramuscularly. So after that year, he was found to be sufficiently restored to mental competency to be able to stand trial. And according to the forensic psychologist, 
that he could and did express remorse about the killings at that point. He was also determined sufficiently competent to enter a plea bargain, which he did do. And the plea agreement was essentially that if Jared Loeffner pled guilty, the state would not pursue the death penalty and Jared in turn could not pursue an insanity defense. He was then sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences with no possibility of parole. So if there's anything to be gained from this story, I do think it's the cautionary nature of it. And by that, I mean the orange flags of a simmering psychosis that started when he was in high school that boiled over into red flags sometime afterwards and in his community college. I do think it's unfortunate that he didn't get treatment earlier and that we aren't better on the system's level at referring and treating people with psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia as the big one. I also think that a discussion of some risk factors for schizophrenia may be worth talking about as another kind of cautionary tale, but I think I'm about out of time on this video and may do that in a second one. I do thank you for your attention.